Okay, <laughs> welcome to Dev309. Thanks so much for spending your Tuesday night with me. I'm excited to tell you that we're actually gonna do two feature launches tonight. So you're gonna hear about it first here in Dev309. Uh, this is the agenda for tonight. I'm gonna first talk about an overview of CI CD for modern applications, and then I'll dig into continuous integration, continuous deployment, and infrastructure as code. And then finally, I'll do a live demo for you on both a serverless application and a containers-based application. So I mentioned this term modern application for CI CD. What is, what is this thing modern application? Uh, this is a term that you might hear a lot at reInvent this week. And what it really comes from is we were thinking at AWS about what is it that makes uh, customers successful on new technologies like containers and serverless? Why are they adopting these new technologies? And so we came up with a set of goals that a lot of our customers come to us and say, these are my goals for adopting cloud. These are my goals for adopting these new compute platforms. And we came up with, here are the tools that you can use, the best practices that you can use to really achieve these goals. So two that are probably near and dear to this crowd is simplifying environment management with serverless technologies and reducing the impact of code changes with microservices architectures. And these two really go hand in hand for serverless and containers. In AWS, we have two serverless options. One is, of course, AWS Lambda for serverless functions, and the other is Fargate for serverless containers. So I'm gonna use both of these technologies in the demo tonight and reference both of them as we go through the CI CD process. But of course, tonight I'm gonna to focus on uh, CI CD, and the goal here is accelerating the delivery of new high quality services with CI CD. So let's talk first about kind of a definition of CI CD. When I think about the release process, I think about four different stages. I think about source, build, test, and production. And I define continuous integration as being really just those first two phases, source and build. Automatically kicking off, the kicking off a release when you have new source in your source code repository, and then completing a build. And then test and production are not yet automated for teams that have adopted only continuous integration. They're still doing manual QA and manual deployments to production. But then continuous deployment is where you have the entire release process fully automated. So the last time a person actually touches a code change going to production is when they check it into the source code repository. So let's look at what are the actions that we're taking in each of these, source, in each of these phases in the source phase, we're checking in source code, and hopefully we're doing peer review, because if you're doing continuous deployment, that's the last time you're gonna see that code before it goes to production. In the build phase, uh, compiling code, doing unit tests, doing style checkers, creating your container images and your function, your function deployment packages. In the test phase, as opposed to unit tests that we did in the build phase, this is where you're doing integration tests with other systems. Uh, you might also be doing load testing, UI testing like Selenium, or security testing like penetration testing. And then finally, you get to production. You're deploying your new code into that production environment and monitoring that code for any errors that that new code has introduced into production. So after you've adopted continuous deployment, you've automated each of these steps what do you get from this? What are the benefits of it? So I looked at this year's State of DevOps report to look at what they found for the effects of CI CD. This report surveys thousands of developers across our industry and looks at what are the effects of some of the best practices we talk about here at reInvent, including CI CD. So one of the first things that they found was deployment frequency, so how often you deploy to production, goes way down from weekly and monthly for teams that haven't adopted these best practices down to hourly and daily deployments. The next one was change lead time. So this is the time from when a developer checks in their source code to the time that it's actually delivered to customers, that it's in their customer hands into production. This goes from one to six months, uh, maybe two to 12 releases a year, down to one to seven days. 
So customers are getting bug fixes and new features written by developers and checked in in under a week. And then the change failure rate. So this is when new code does go into production, how often does it cause issues in production? How often does it have to be rolled back? And how often does it block new changes from going through because you're trying to figure out what went wrong in that last deployment? This goes from about half, half of deployments for these teams cause issues in production and have to be rolled back, down to zero to 15%. This one was the most unintuitive to me personally because you would think that as you automate all these things, as you're doing hourly or daily deployments, you're breaking a lot more stuff, right? But it's actually not true. One of the great things is that as you start to deploy more and more often, you're also integrating more often as a team. Everything's going on to the uh, master branch and you're doing trunk-based development. But also, you're not having the problem where as changes start to batch up when you're doing these monthly or biannual deployments, something in there is definitely gonna, go to, gonna cause a problem, right? We all have bugs. But as you start to release things more frequently, as soon as the developer has checked them in, the lower the likelihood that that's actually gonna happen, and it's way more easy to figure out what change actually caused problems in production. So teams on the left-hand side are shipping 200, 1,000 changes that have been batching up in their source code repository for months versus teams who are doing daily or hourly deployments where it's about one, maybe one to three changes per deployment. It's really easy to pinpoint what went wrong. But one of the things that I really love about this report is how it shows that these results are achievable by so many teams. So they found that almost half of software teams in our industry had these results from adopting best practices like CICD. So this is not secret sauce, right? Anybody can adopt these practices and see these results in their organization. So in order to show you how to achieve some of these results and implement them for containers and, and serverless, I'm gonna walk you through what I see as really the three pillars of releasing modern applications like serverless and container-based applications. So continuous integration, continuous deployment, and then infrastructure as code. So let's first start with continuous integration. So as a reminder, this is where you've adopted continuous integration. So you've now automated source phase and build phase. You're always automatically kicking off a build when you check code into your source code repository. So there's a couple of different goals here for teams that are adopting this best practice. One is that you're, of course, automatically kicking off a new release when new code is checked in. No one has to remember to do this on your team. The second is that you're building and testing code in a consistent, repeatable environment. So not doing it on your laptop where anything could be installed. Uh, doing it in a consistent, repeatable environment. Third is continually having an artifact that's ready for deployment. It may not be QA tested yet, it may not have gone through integration tests yet, but you always have something that's ready to go for going through the rest of the process in test and production. And then finally, continuous integration allows you to continually close that feedback loop back to the developer when the build fails. So you way more often have a green master branch that builds and runs unit tests uh, than if you're relying on these monthly or biannual releases to production. So for continuous integration, I use AWS Code Pipeline. Code Pipeline is a continuous delivery service for fast and reliable application updates. And I'll take a minute to really brag about some of the performance updates that this team did this year. Uh, they saw up to, I believe, 80% reduction in pipeline overhead this year. And so the code pipeline pipelines are truly fast. It's amazing to watch them uh, speed through all of their stages in the pipeline. So in code pipeline, you model and visualize your release process as a pipeline, as different stages in that pipeline. And then code pipeline will build, test, and deploy your code every time there's a new code change. And I'll walk through some of the AWS integrations it has, but it also has third-party tools integrated. 
So Code Pipeline has a few supported sources, so the things that it will automatically trigger a release from. On the source code side, you can pick a branch in your source code repository in CodeCommit or GitHub. And then you can also store your uh, code in S3 uh, if you're doing maybe a dump from your uh, on-prem repository into S3. It'll pick up on any changes to an object or a folder. But I feel like there's something missing here. There's something missing for containers customers in the room, and that is triggering off of a Docker image. So many times we have maybe a base image or a sidecar image that we need to bundle into our application or build a new image on top of. And I'm super happy to announce we're doing launch number one. Uh, AWS Code Pipeline now uses Amazon Elastic Container Registry, ECR, as a pipeline source. Yay! So you now have a third option for what's going to trigger your pipeline and be pulled into that pipeline. The third one is to pick a Docker tag. So if you have a base image, you can pick the release tag from that base image in the registry uh, and trigger the pipeline on that. So what this looks like, as I said, if you've got a base image, what would typically happen is you've got your source code with your main application Docker file and then your ECR repository with that base image release tag and both of those can fill it, uh, feed into the build stage so you can build your new application Docker image in the build and then deploy it later. So there are other inputs into our release process, right? Other than source code and other than Docker images and ECR. So Code Pipeline has a couple of options for triggering the release on these other inputs into our release process automatically. One is Amazon CloudWatch events. Any CloudWatch event can actually trigger a pipeline. You can do a nightly release with a scheduled cron job, or you can pay attention to any other service, for example, AWS health events that are gonna notify you about Fargate platform retirements. And then for third-party services that you might be using, Code Pipeline supports webhooks. So services like Docker Hub, Quay, and Artifactory, if you've got uh, a Docker image in Docker Hub that you need to trigger the pipeline off of, or Artifactory if for both serverless and containers you've got some libraries that you want to trigger your pipeline on when new versions are released. You can get a webhook URL from Code Pipeline and then plug it into any of these third parties or anything else that supports a webhook and that will automatically trigger your pipeline. So let's move on to the build phase of continuous integration. For that, I use AWS Code Build. It's a fully managed build service that compiles code, runs tests like your unit tests or even integration tests, and then produces software packages like those container images and like those Lambda deployment packages. What I like about it is that it scales continuously and processes multiple builds concurrently. So you don't have to worry about a build queue you also don't have to worry about any build servers to manage. It is also serverless. Uh, and you pay by the minute for only the compute resources that you use. And then to complete the feedback loop back to your developers, you can monitor builds through CloudWatch events or Code Pipeline will monitor the build for you. There's a couple of features that I wanted to call out specifically for containers and serverless customers. So each build runs in a new container for a consistent, immutable environment. So that's how it's different from our laptop or from a shared build server. Uh, every new build is in a brand new, fresh environment. And then both Docker and the AWS CLI are installed in every build environment that's provided by CodeBuild. And then you can also provide your own custom build environment. If you've got a custom mix of tools that you need to use to build and test your code and then produce that software package, you can create a Docker image based on that. So in code build, the way that you specify what commands constitute your build, what needs to happen to compile your code or run your unit tests or produce your software package is to write a build spec. So this build spec is an example for Lambda that you would put in your source code repository. And here I'm doing a node function. So I'm doing npm ci to install all of my dependencies, npm test to run my unit tests, and then I'm doing app AWS CloudFormation package to package up my serverless application. 
And then this is an example for Docker. So this is all the commands that you would normally run on your laptop. These should be pretty familiar to the containers crowd. Docker build, tag, and push into ECR. So it's really anything that you can do on your laptop, anything that you're doing uh, to build your code today, you can run in code build. So let's review the continuous integration goals. One, automatically kick off a new release when new code is checked in. We can do that with code pipeline. Two, build and test your code in a consistent, repeatable environment. We can do that in code build with a new Docker container every time. Third, continually have an artifact ready for deployment. So in your code build build, you would produce that uh, Docker image, push it into ECR, or have a serverless application template that's ready to go. And finally, continually close the feedback loop when the build fails, which you can do in both code build and code pipeline. So let's take a look at, now we've finished continuous integration, let's take a look at continuous deployment. So in continuous deployment, as a refresher, this is source, build, test, and production are all completely automated now. So let's look at the goals of this pillar. Number one is to automatically deploy new changes to staging environments for testing. So in addition to all of the goals that we saw for continuous integration, now we need to go deploy that artifact that's continually ready for us to deploy. Two is to deploy to production safely without impacting customers. There's a lot of fear around adopting continuous deployment, and we wanna make sure that each and every deployment is as safe as we can make it without any person interacting with it. And third is deliver to customers faster. This is where we really start to see some of those results in deployment lead time, deployment frequency, and change failure rate that we saw statistics for earlier. So for deploying to staging environments and production environments, I use AWS Code Deploy. Code Deploy automates code deployments to any instance and to Lambda. Uh, it handles all the complexity of updating your applications. You don't have to write a lot of code to do that. And it avoids downtime during application deployment, and it rolls back automatically if any failure is detected. So it's safe for uh, automating deployments to your production system. So Code Deploy deploys to EC2, Lambda, and even on-premise instances. So let's take a look at for what this looks like for Lambda. So there's a few unique Lambda features that Code Deploy uses. One is that it uses Lambda-weighted aliases to shift traffic to your new function code. So you can use uh, canary deployments, so something like shift 10% of my traffic to live traffic for 10 minutes, watch alarms and make sure that nothing's going wrong, and then shift the rest. And this is all completely automated by code deploy, so there's no person making this decision along the way. Or you can choose something like linear, where you wanna shift 10% more of your traffic every 10 minutes until it's done. Code deploy also supports what's called validation hooks. At each stage of the deployment, you can run this Lambda function hook and test that your new function code is working as you expected in this new production environment. One of the most exciting things is fast rollback. Because this is weighted aliases, your function code is already still there in Lambda from V1, so you can really quickly roll back, just dial back to zero for the new function code, and go all the way back to 100% for the old function code. And then finally, Code Deploy keeps track of the full history of your deployments, and then also integrates with CloudWatch events and SNS for giving you updates on your deployment status. So this is an example of what you would add to your serverless application template for Lambda. Uh, you can see the deployment preference clause there. So here I have configured the Canary 10% for 10 minutes deployment type. And then I'm also watching a CloudWatch alarm. I'm having code deploy watch a CloudWatch alarm for any errors that I've introduced into my function. And then some hooks to, before traffic is actually shifted to customers, invoke that function, make sure it's correctly running in my environment. So this, let's walk through an example of what this actually looks like. 
Typically, you would start out with, let's say you have a Lambda function behind an API gateway, and you have 100% of your traffic going to this V1 function code behind a weighted alias called live. So what you would do when you start the deployment is to upload this new function code. And at this point, you start the deployment, and code deploy configures 0% of your traffic is going to that new function code, and 100% is going to the old function code. And at this point, this is when you have the opportunity to run this validation hook to actually invoke that v2 function and make sure that you get the expected results back from it. So then, once you've shifted 10% of the traffic for this canary deployment, you still have 90% of your traffic going to the old code. You can have code deploy wait for 10 minutes. In the entire time, it will monitor your CloudWatch alarms. If at any time they go into alarm state, it'll roll back in seconds to the old code. And then once that 10 minutes is, is done, code deploy will shift the rest of the traffic to V2. And now you've completed the deployment and nothing is going to the old function code. But you know, I said code deploy deploys to EC2, Lambda, on-premise instances. Again, it feels like there's something missing for containers. So I'm super happy to announce feature launch number two. AWS Code Deploy now automates blue-green deployments to AWS Fargate and Amazon ECS. <laughs> Let me walk you through some of the great features that we have here for blue-green for containers. Uh, the first step that Code Deploy is going to do is provision new green tasks with your new image and then it's gonna flip the traffic at the load balancer once all of those tasks are ready and are passing health checks. For the code deploy integration, code deploy again supports validation hooks. So again, you can run a Lambda function and make a sample request to this green fleet, make sure that it, you get the response back that you want, hopefully a status code 200, uh, before any live traffic is going to that new fleet. Then, of course, there's fast rollback within seconds. Because it keeps the blue tasks around for a period of time that you configure, if there's any problems with the green fleet, once you, once you have live traffic going to it, you can very quickly roll back to, through a load balancer flip to put all of the live traffic back on the blue fleet. Again, you can monitor status, deployment status with code deploy and the, list the full deployment history for your ECS service. Uh, there's also two things that go along with this launch, uh, some little bonuses. Uh, for encode pipeline, there's a new action type, new deployment action called code deploy ECS to orchestrate all of this for you to start the deployment, to register a new task definition in ECS. And then there's also a new command in the AWS CLI uh, for people like Jenkins users or other deployment uh, uh, continuous delivery users uh, called AWS ECS deploy. So this is a single line command for registering your task definition, kicking off the deployment, and then monitoring the deployment and returning an exit code uh, if it fails. So the way that you instruct code deploy on what it needs to do in this deployment is to create an app spec. So in addition to your ECS task definition in your repository, you would have an app spec file in your repository as well. And that would describe what is the task definition that I'm supposed to deploy, what is the load balancer that you want me to do the traffic flip on, and then what are all of the hooks that you want me to invoke to test out this new fleet of containers. So let me walk you through a visualization of what this looks like when Code Deploy orchestrates a blue-green deployment. Typically, this is your setup today if you're using ECS or Fargate. You have an application load balancer. Then you have a production traffic listener on port 80. You have a target group. And then you have 100% of your prod traffic going to this Fargate service. In order to get set up for Code Deploy blue-green, you would add a second test traffic listener, let's say on a different port or even on a different path in your application load balancer, and then add a second target group as well. So what happens when you create this deployment is Code Deploy is going to instruct ECS to spin up a new set of green tasks with your new container image. 
At this point, 100% of production traffic is still going to the blue tasks while all of those green tasks are provisioning. Once they pass all of their health checks in the green fleet, then CodeDeploy is going to add a route from the test traffic listener on, let's say, port 9000 to that second target group and put all of those green tasks behind that target group. So now what you have is test traffic. You can hit port 9000 of your application load balancer and run real requests end to end through your load balancer down to those green tasks. Make sure you get your expected result, status code 200. And then at this point, 100% of prod traffic is still going to the blue tasks while you validate this green task fleet. Finally, once all of that is done and once you've had your validation hooks run, CodeDeploy is going to flip the traffic from the production traffic listener down to that second target group. So at this point, within seconds, you have 0% of your prod traffic going to the blue tasks and 100% going to the green tasks. At this point, you can configure a wait time of as little as a couple of minutes to monitor alarms, or you can do multiple hours. And throughout that entire period, CodeDeploy will monitor your alarms and roll back automatically if there's any issues. And then finally, once that wait time is done and the deployment is finishing, ECS will spin down all of those blue tasks and leave you with just that green task fleet. One of the things I wanna walk through in terms of deployment safety uh, that's really important for containers is tagging for deployment safety. So it's really important because in ECS and in other orchestrators, Docker tags are resolved every time an individual container starts. And that doesn't just happen at deployment, right? That can happen during scale out, when you're scaling up your service. And then it can also happen if you're having a scheduled maintenance event or a container dies for whatever reason and gets replaced by ECS. So if you're deploying a latest tag or a prod tag, what can actually happen is you can end up with untested code in production. So let me walk you through how that happens. This is an example where in my task definition, I'm using the latest tag, and I've spun up my Fargate service using that, and I have this image whose ID is 1111, but is currently tagged to latest. So I have a build that pushes a new latest tag, and this is now 2222, and nothing's changed with my service, right? All my build did was push in a new image, totally safe. Now my Fargate service in production has a scale up event, I'm handling more traffic, and all of a sudden I'm now running this latest tag, this new one, in production before I've had a chance to run my integration tests, potentially before I've had a chance to run unit tests if I pushed before that. And so now I've got this mixed bag of tasks running different versions of code in my production environment. So one of the things I recommend to teams is to use immutable tags, something like a build ID that's unlikely to occur again, or even to use the image ID that you see on your, if you run Docker images, that unique image ID, which is actually a SHA-256 digest for that particular image, that particular binary. So these are some examples uh, these slides will be published on SlideShare that you can use in your uh, code build build spec or in your other build system to generate that unique build ID or to record that unique SHA-256 digest to put in your task definition. So let's look through what happens when I'm using build ID for my task, uh, for my tag. So here I have a build that pushes a new image tagged with my new build ID. This is a unique UUID, let's say, and so those two, build those two tags don't conflict with each other, and in production, I'm still running that first build tag. So that doesn't change, even though I've had this new build happen. And then once I actually do a deployment, that is the time at which the task definition gets registered in this service, and all of my containers get replaced, with my new build image that's already been through a staging environment and through integration tests. So let's review the continuous deployment goals. Number one, automatically deploy new changes to staging environments for testing. You can do that in code pipeline by simply adding a staging 
stage and environment in your pipeline. Second is deploying to production safely without impacting customers. The code deploy safety features that I talked about, validation hooks, canary deployments, blue-green deployments, fast rollbacks, and automatic alarm monitoring are all really great tools for you to use in minimizing impact to customers in production. And then finally, all of this getting people out of the way and automating it all with code pipeline helps us to deliver to customers faster, which is really what we're trying to get out of this. So now let's look at, we looked at continuous deployment. Now let's look at infrastructure as code. I haven't really talked about infrastructure as code yet. I actually see infrastructure as code as very similar to continuous deployment. It covers the source phase. You're checking in your infrastructure code into your source code repository. It may go through a build phase to prepare your infrastructure as code template for deployment. And then it's getting deployed into a staging environment and tests, and finally getting deployed to production. So these are some goals that I have for, for infrastructure as code on my teams at Amazon. One is to make infrastructure changes repeatable and predictable. And the reason for that is if we're deploying into our staging environment, we want to know that the same exact thing is going to happen when we deploy this to production. Because we want to predict if anything's going to go wrong. That's the whole point of the staging environment. And so if we're making ad hoc changes to both of these environments, it's really hard to predict what's going to happen, what the impact to production is going to be when we make these infrastructure changes there. Second is to release infrastructure changes using the exact same tools as code changes. And by that, I mean storing them in the source code repository, doing peer review like pull requests on them, sending them out through a pipeline like in code pipeline, and having the same staging and test environments. And then also running the same uh, integration tests in the staging environment to validate the changes that the infrastructure has made. And finally, I keep referring to staging environment. It's important to replicate production environments in a staging environment to enable continuous testing. So let's dig into what I mean by continuous testing. I think that for, especially for containers and for serverless architectures, they're so complex, right? We're adopting microservices. There's a bunch of services and a bunch of managed services on top of that that we're calling out to. We're probably using queues and step functions and managed databases. And then we've got a bunch of microservices that are talking to each other. And so unit tests where we're mocking out dependencies and we're doing static analysis, it's still really hard to figure out how's this going to act in production? How's it going to act when this other microservice calls me? And what assumptions am I making about the microservice that I need to call? or the managed service that I need to call. So what I've been thinking about more and more often is we really need to validate the entire environment as we're releasing these serverless applications and container-based applications into production. So one is to run integration tests in a staging environment against real dependencies and real environments. Uh, do load testing in a real environment to understand how your Lambda function or your uh, infrastructure around that Lambda function or container behaves under load. Doing penetration testing to make sure you haven't leaked any secrets into your staging environment that show up in the environment in Lambda or in, in Fargate. And then finally, monitoring to test the impact of deployments on an environment. What I see so many times on my teams at Amazon is that deployments are impactful. We don't do things like graceful shutdown where we're draining uh, requests that are currently going to a function or a container. And so you end up during a deployment with a whole bunch of draft requests. And so in a staging environment, we're able to monitor that with the same alarms that we have in production to catch any of those problems early in our pipeline. So let's look at what it means to use the exact same tools with continuous, in a, continuous deployment and using them for infrastructure as code. So this is an example of what your pipeline overall would look like for continuous deployment of infrastructure. One is you would have a source code repository and a master branch that you would check these changes into. 
And then in the build stage, you might prepare a template. And I'll show you a couple of different tools where you need to prepare a template. And then you would have this test stage where you're deploying into this staging environment. If you're using code deploy, that means creating and executing a change set. And then you would do the exact same thing for production. The exact same templates are being deployed into your staging environment and are then being deployed into your production environment. So let's walk through a couple of different tools for infrastructure as code that are specific to serverless and containers. One is the serverless application model for Lambda users. This is an open source framework for building serverless applications on AWS. You can think of this as kind of like a shorthand syntax for expressing your functions that are part of your application, your APIs that are coming through API Gateway, your databases that are managed, and your event source mappings. And what happens when you deploy these SAM templates is that it all gets expanded out into CloudFormation syntax. So because it's based on CloudFormation provisioning, it supports all the AWS CloudFormation resource types out of the box automatically. So this is an example of a SAM template. And it's kind of showing that how it's a, it's a shorthand syntax for your serverless applications. So I'm expressing a serverless function and I'm expressing the API that this needs to be reached at in an API gateway. But notice I don't have to specify that API gateway. And then lower down, you'll see serverless simple table. So these are a pretty, sh pretty short few lines of YAML that actually expand out into a Lambda function, an API gateway, a DynamoDB table, and then all the IAM roles and event source mappings that hook all of this up together. So you can use the SAM CLI to package and deploy SAM templates. Um, I'm really excited. Uh, last week, we launched SAM build command. So this is especially great for Python Lambda function users. It makes sure that if you have any native dependencies or native extensions as part of your Python application, it makes sure that you're building those native extensions against the exact right versions of libraries for the function environment in Lambda. So it's really a great way to package up those Python functions for Lambda. And then finally, you would use SAM package or SAM deploy. What this looks like in code pipeline is that SAM package and SAM deploy are wrappers around CloudFormation change sets. And so you would still use the CloudFormation actions in code pipeline with any SAM application. But then in Jenkins, it's really easy to use the SAM CLI plugin for Jenkins, install that in your Jenkins server, and deploy to Lambda with serverless applications. I'm really excited for containers users with, for the uh, cloud development kit called the CDK. So this is another open source framework, but this time instead of YAML, it defines cloud infrastructure in TypeScript. So it's literally infrastructure as code. It provides a library of higher level resource types. Because this is a programming language, these are classes, they, we, they call them constructs. Uh, but they're higher level abstractions on top of CloudFormation. So they have all of these AWS best practices built in by default for how to configure these resource types together. And then they're just packaged as NPM modules that you can consume in your uh, application that's using infrastructure as code. So it provisions all the resources with CloudFormation. You can think of this as uh, generating or compiling down to CloudFormation from that TypeScript. And because it's using CloudFormation, it supports all of the CloudFormation resource types out of the box automatically. This is an example of a CDK template for a Fargate service with a load balancer in front of it. Just one line, ec2.vpc network. This is a high level class for VPC networks. So it includes the VPC itself, but also the subnets, the security groups, the internet gateway, the NAT gateways and route tables. So you can imagine how much CloudFormation this generates. And then there's a high level Fargate class. This includes the ECS service, the task definition, the application load balancer, the listener rule, the target group, and then optionally even the Route 53 alias record. So all of this, these simple lines generate a full package 
load balance, Fargate service, all configured together for you. So just these 22 lines of TypeScript code generates over 400 lines of CloudFormation syntax. And this is all with the AWS best practices built in on how to configure your Fargate service, how to configure your VPC, how to configure DNS records for your Fargate service. So it's a great time saver for doing things out of the box really quickly. The other side of this is a feature called applets in the CDK. This is a YAML version of the TypeScript classes that are part of the CDK. So you can use the same constructs for these high level uh, resource types, but in YAML syntax. So here I only have a single property, just the image that I wanna run. And this is gonna generate all of those same resources, the VPC, the cluster, the Fargate service, the task definition, the load balancer, the listener rule, the target group. It's gonna generate, again, those 400 lines of cloud formation. The other side of this is modeling your pipelines. So you can also use infrastructure as code for your pipelines. One of the things that I tend to see on my teams is that ideally, we, for a new feature, we would add a new microservice, but it's a huge pain to set up a new pipeline, set up all the environments, configure the pipeline. We've got so many regions now that the pipeline just goes off the page. And so that's a huge pain. And so one of the things that we've been really adopting at Amazon is using infrastructure as code for the release process as well. So codifying all our best practices in code. So one of the things about the CDK that I really like is that it minimizes that copy and paste across many, many microservice pipelines by using this object-oriented language. So we can define a higher level class that defines, here's what my pipelines generally look like. I've got all the AWS regions in them. I have a staging environment. I have a dev environment and my source code. And then you can just use that class across all of your pipelines. The CDK also has a lot of high-level constructs for, for code pipeline in general. So it's really easy to add new actions to your pipeline with the CDK, and it will automatically configure all the role policies that you need for that pipeline. So this is a, a truncated example of a pipeline class that I could put in my source code repository that defined how I think about releasing my microservice. Uh, all you're seeing here is that I'm adding a GitHub source action, and then beyond this, I would have build and test and production, because all my pipelines generally look the same. And then in my stack, that's going to generate a huge cloud formation uh, template for my stack, I can just stamp out these microservice pipelines and really easily add a new microservice anytime it's warranted in my architecture. So you can use the CDK to synthesize and deploy CDK templates. There's a command line for it. In code pipeline, again, just like Sam, you would use the CloudFormation deployment actions to, use, to, to deploy any synthesized CDK application. Synthesis in CDK simply means generating the YAML or JSON CloudFormation template from your TypeScript code. And then using the CDK, CLI, and Jenkins can really be a time saver in deploying these applications to production. So let's uh, circle back to the infrastructure as code goals. Uh, make infrastructure changes repeatable and predictable. With cloud formation, that's really easy because you're deploying the same template from staging to production. It'll do the same things. Number two is releasing infrastructure changes using the same tools as code changes having these infrastructure as code pipelines to deliver infrastructure changes to production. And finally, replicating production environment in a staging environment to enable continuous testing. So having that pipeline that has really the exact same shape of your service pipeline with source, build, test, and production, but having your infrastructure as code changes flowing through it. So now we've looked at infrastructure as code and we've completed all the pillars and now I want to show you a live demo of what this would look like for a container application and a serverless application. So for this, I have uh, reinventtrivia.com. Uh, so I can click on any of these cards, 
And of course, the answer is 2012, I heard correct. So this is a static site, and it's backed by an API that's serving up all of these trivia questions and the answers. And I had a similar application that was running in EC2 for a while, but it was really easy to package it up into a container and put it in Fargate and not have to worry about EC2. So these are, this is an example of the API response that I would get from my Fargate service. So here we can see in the ECS console, I have a test environment, a staging environment, and then a production environment for my backend API service. And this is an example of the CDK applet YAML that I would use to define my entire test and production stages. So I, have, I can have an image here, a desired count, and then I can have even, it's SSL enabled, and so I have a, a certificate manager certificate, and it will create the Route 53 aliases for me. Then I have, I thought it would be cool to do a chatbot for this. Uh, so I integrated with Amazon Lex for natural language processing. So I have a chatbot sitting in my uh, Slack channel, and so I can play with it. And so this is a Lambda-based application that's integrated with Lex. One of the cool things about when you use SAM is that it's going to show up as an application in the console. And so I can go into one of these, like chatbot test, and I can see, here's how to get started with my development environment. There's Cloud9, there's a Visual Studio plugin, there's an Eclipse plugin, there's also an IntelliJ plugin that's on GitHub right now. I can see my SAM template that I have deployed. And then I can see all the resources that are part of this. And then I can also see the deployment history for this application, as well as all of the metrics for the resources. And so we saw a little bit of that template in the console, but this is my serverless function application that's written in SAM syntax. And then finally, I have a whole bunch of pipelines for this. I have my static site pipeline, uh, infrastructure pipeline. I also have a base image, a base Docker image for my Fargate service. I've got the chatbot pipeline and the backend pipeline. And then I have all of these defined in CDK. So this pipeline class is my sort of shape pipeline uh, class, and then I just use it in the rest because I have the same shape of pipeline and everything. So let's go, let's go release some changes. So we can take a look at my base image one. I have it blocked for now, but you can see I, this is really a continuous integration pipeline almost. I only have source and build. But then we can look at my trivia backend pipeline and see this is where I'm using that ECR source action in code pipeline. So anytime that base image pipeline pushes into my ECR repository, this pipeline will automatically trigger. And then you can see the actual image ID that's flowing through the pipeline and into the build. And then of course I have my source up on GitHub, so it's tracking that automatically for me and going into the build. And then I have a test stage and a prod stage. And then we can take a look at the chatbot pipeline. So whereas the, the backend pipeline is using Amazon ECS blue-green, so we're gonna see the blue-green deployments, this pipeline is more of an infrastructure as code pipeline. So it's preparing a change set in CloudFormation and then executing that change set in CloudFormation. So I have a change that has been uh, blocked here for a little bit, so let's go and enable that. And so automatically, the change moved to the next stage. It's now, it's gonna prepare changes in CloudFormation for me, and then let's go over to, this is the backend pipeline. So I'm gonna enable this transition as well and we can get the blue-green deployment going. So on the chatbot pipeline, this is now in progress. So we can go over here and see that it is preparing this change set for me. 
So it created that one for me. And then let's check in on the, this one. So now I have my prod deployment for blue green to my back end. So I can go and click and go right to the deployment. And one of the nice things that it, the Code Deploy Console has is this visualization of where I am in the deployment. So it's showing me that 100% of my traffic is still on that original set of tasks, my blue tasks, and 0% is in the replacement or the green tasks. So what it's doing right now is it's deploying that task set. So what's happening is if we scroll down, we can see that in the replacement task, there are three desired count, same as the previous one. Two are running, three are now running, and then one was pending. And then down here we can see all of the stages. At each of these stages, I have the opportunity to run a validation hook. So I can show you one of those hooks. Uh, these are just simple Lambda functions. And then all that I'm doing here is making a, a request to the URL, so the, t the test URL, which is on that different port, like 9,000. Uh, all I'm doing here is really simple. I'm just looking for a, a status code, and then I'm looking that the length of the JSON that's returned is what I expect. Uh, so pretty shallow check here. Um, but then at the end of it, I go to Code Deploy and report on the status of this check back to Code Deploy. And then if we go over to the ECS console, one of the things we're gonna see in addition to the tasks that are running, so now there's six tasks because there's a blue fleet and a green fleet, but we'll also see those cloud room, those code deploy deployments. Uh, we can see that this is blue green. We can see that this is using this code deploy deployment group. I can go here to go see the full deployment history with code deploy. And then we can see that this blue green deployment is currently in progress. So let's go back to the code deploy console. So all of the deployment lifecycle events have succeeded. What's happening now is that it's waiting for a minute. I dialed down that wait time just down to a minute for the demo. So what it's doing right now is it's monitoring my CloudWatch alarms to make sure that this didn't impact any, uh, anything in production. So at this point, if a customer comes to my reInvent Trivia API, this is currently going to that green fleet, but if any problems occurred here, if I started seeing 500s come out of this application, then what would happen is that Code Deploy would very quickly roll back to that original task set because it's all still sitting there in my service. It's just no longer taking production traffic. So at this point now, the, ter the original task set has been terminated. 100% of my traffic is now going here. So this deployment is succeeded. So let's go back to this pipeline. So now that's succeeded. So we've got, gotten all the way through the pipeline and we can see that my change is showing up here along with my ECR source. Let's go back to the chatbot. So we now have the change set uh, in progress right now, so we can go over to CloudFormation, see what's going on. So one of the things we see here is that at it, as it's updating that alias, it's actually triggered a code deploy deployment from this CloudFormation stack update. So I can go over to code deploy, and let's list the deployments that are currently in progress. So I can see this one, blue-green for AWS Lambda is in progress. Let's go to that deployment ID. And here we're seeing that I'm actually using a Canary deployment. I'm using 10% of traffic for 10 minutes, I think. So this probably won't finish in time. But it's showing us that 90% of traffic is currently going to the original function code. Then 10% of traffic is going to the new function code. And so at this point, if I go into my Slack channel, I have a 10% chance that this is gonna go to the, the new function code and 10% to the old function code. So since that's gonna take a while, I'm gonna finish up here. Perfect. 
Um, so just to visualize some of the infrastructure that you saw there, again, I had an application load balancer in front of a Fargate service, then a DynamoDB table as well behind that. And then for the web application in the browser, I had just an S3 static site with a Route 53 zone on top of it. And then for the chatbot, I was running that in Slack. Amazon Lex has a direct integration with Slack, so I was using that for the natural language processing. And then I was using Lambda for the actual bot function that was driving the conversation through the game. So before we finish up today, these are some related sessions that I wanted to call out. As every 325, this is going to have the uh, general managers for Fargate, for ECS, for Lambda, and for developer tools all on stage together. And they're all gonna walk through a little bit deeper about how we're thinking about DevOps, microservices, and serverless on functions and containers on Thursday. So that's gonna be a really great session. It had, I can tell you it has a lot of empty seats, so you, get a, you have a great chance of getting in. Uh, SRV 305, if you are interested in, in hearing more about how we're thinking about modern applications and where this term comes from and where the goals and the tools come from, there's a session called Inside AWS Technology Choices for Modern Applications that's led by uh, Tim Bray, a senior principal at AWS, on both Wednesday and Thursday. And then finally, if you're interested in digging more into infrastructure as code, Dev 327 is Beyond the Basics, Advanced Infrastructure as Code Programming on AWS, uh, uh, led by the CloudFormation team, so they can dig more into that. So thank you so much. Thank you for spending your Tuesday night with me. Uh, I hope that you check out both the new Lambda SAM features as well as Code Deploy Blue Green deployments for ECS and the ECR source action in Code Pipeline. Thank you.